Baseball's most famous knuckleballer had a year in 1978 that will blow your mind, but at the time, it was overlooked. Before we get into the video, make sure to comment below who you want to see talked about on the channel next, because this video would not have been possible without this comment. Phil Necro in his career became the only knuckleballer to become a member of the 300 win, 3000 strikeout club, a historic group that cements a Hall of Fame career in the eyes of the voters. Along with this, he threw the fourth most innings for a pitcher of all time, with 5,404, only behind Cy Young, Pud Galvin, and Walter Johnson. In terms of war, Necro ranked 11th all time among pitchers, posting a 97 war for his career. Before we go over Necro's incredible 1978 season, let's discuss how he got there. Phil Necro was taught the knuckleball by his father and committed to primarily throwing the pitch once breaking into the minor leagues. After four years in the minors and another year spent in the US Army, Necro made the Milwaukee Braves opening day roster in 1964. It would take another three years before Necro would become a regular starter with the Braves. He posted a league leading 1.87 ERA in 1967, the only ERA title of his career, over 207 innings of work. Jumping a couple years later, 1969 was Necro's first All-Star season, posting a 2.56 ERA, winning 23 games and throwing 21 complete games. He would finish second in Cy Young voting this season. Necro had a down year following this fantastic season, but then over the next six years from ages 32 to 37 was the reliable workhorse that he was known to be. He posted a 3.02 ERA and averaged 274 innings a year in this span. 1977 was a year that he posted an ERA above 4 for just the second time in his career. He was still able to lead the league in innings, because come on, we're talking about Phil Necro here. That now brings us to Phil Necro's historic 1978 season, a year that started off on the wrong foot. 8 runs allowed, 6 of which were earned in his opening start, against the Dodgers, in which he surprisingly was able to make it through 5 innings. He followed this up with a bounce back start, firing a complete game and allowing just 2 earned runs. April was a very rocky road, as Necro's success in this month was sporadic at best. A rough start, a good start, then Necro decided to cap off the month with back-to-back -back complete games and allowed just one unearned run. Looking at the complete picture, the bad starts were nearly erased when looking at his 2.66 ERA for the month. However, the 2-4 record definitely remembers those blow-up outings. You'll start to see that this coupled with little run support becomes the reason for such a poor record on paper. A trend that starts to make itself apparent when looking at Necro's season is a slow start to the month before settling in and firing off some solid outings consecutively. May was no exception as he surrendered 6 earned runs in 5 innings, nearly duplicating his season opener. Overall, May was a solid month as he posted a 3.27 ERA and hurled 3 complete games, although one of those complete games was not your prototypical CG. Nico practically put the Braves on his back on May 17th as he threw a 10 inning complete game, allowing just one run and four hits. Luckily, Necro was rewarded with a win for his effort that game, as the Braves came out on top 2-1 against the Mets. Necro nearly cloned his May performance to June, posting an ERA just one point lower than the previous month. Necro's 3-3 record includes some tough luck losses, as he allowed just two runs over eight innings and three runs over nine innings, yet came away with the loss in both of these outings. In just three months, Necro now had 10 complete games, with three of those being shutouts. July was a huge step forward for Necro, as he got into nine games, two of which were relief appearances, one of which he picked up the save in. Necro's 2.69 ERA for the month was his best yet. Obviously, it was a different time, but the 63 and two thirds innings thrown by Necro in this month alone would be astronomical in the game today. Sandy Alcantara, baseball's modern day top of the line workhorse, had his heaviest workload in June of 2022. He made six starts, one of which was a complete game, and pitched 47 and two-thirds innings. It's crazy how much the game has evolved, to where modern day starters are not expected to pitch deep into games. Alcantara is a rarity in the game today, but the comparison speaks for itself. Now let's go back to Phil Necro's 1978. Heading into August, Phil Necro's season through the first half saw him throw 167 innings, while tallying a 3.13 ERA. Not bad numbers at all, especially considering that his 9-9 record might suggest otherwise in regards to his success. In back-to-back -back months, Necro fired four complete games, this time with one of them being a shutout. His 3.32 ERA was surprisingly the highest for any month this season, which should tell you a thing or two about the level of excellence Necro established for himself in this season. 
Phil Necro's rough start to the season felt like a distant memory heading into the final month of the season in September. For his grand finale, Necro took elements of other months and found a way to incorporate them into his final act. Unfortunately, one of those scenes included a callback to starting the month off slow and finishing strong. In his first start of September, Necro may have thrown six innings, but he allowed five runs, four of which were earned. Luckily, Necro had a few more tricks up his sleeve. Like we talked about earlier, Necro didn't stop at a nine inning complete game if the game wasn't over. With his team refusing to score runs for him, Necro took matters into his own hands. On September 13th, he couldn't help himself and threw another 10 inning complete game. Wait, hold on a second here. This can't be right. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't believe this. Ripley's believe it or not, Necro finished this game with a no decision. The game went 12 innings and Gene Garber, a very solid reliever in this day, pitched two innings and got the win as the Braves won 5-3 over the Giants. Now I don't know what he said after this game ended, but I would imagine he was both relieved and frustrated. Can you imagine throwing 10 innings and then losing the game? I wonder if that's happened before. For the month of September, Necro finished with his highest workload of the season, throwing 65 innings and putting up a glimmering 2.22 ERA, the best of any month. If it wasn't for an oddball no decision that would have been a complete game on almost any other night, Necro would have had 5 complete games, but he settled for his third straight month of 4 CGs. Somehow, in his best month, Necro managed a 3-4 record. The unfortunate reality is that Necro entering his final 3 starts had a 3-1 record, but entered a weird situation where he allowed two runs, one run, and four runs, and walked away with three losses. All three starts, he made it through eight or more innings, and while he probably shouldn't have won all three starts, he certainly shouldn't have been 0-3. Overall for the season, Necro posted an absurd 10.4 war in 1978, 10 if you're looking at baseball reference, the best of all MLB players that year. Ron Guidry finished second with a 9.6 war. For Necro's efforts in 1978, he was acknowledged, but by no means celebrated. He finished 6th in Cy Young voting, which as we'll discuss, is a travesty, and in MVP voting, he was barely considered, finishing 17th. Hey Patrick, are you angry too? Yeah. What's the matter? I can't see my forehead. Don't worry, we'll be delving into that ridiculous outcome here in a second. Luckily, Necro was at least invited to the All-Star Game for the fourth time of his career in 1978. An underrated part of Necro's game was his ability to field his position well. He won five gold gloves throughout his 24-year career, with 1978 being one of the years he took home the award. He won back-to-back -back gold gloves twice in his career as he took it home in 1979, as well as in his final two-year stretch with the Braves before he signed as a free agent with the Yankees at the crisp age of 45. Wow. I should probably mention that he made the All-Star Game this year and would play three more years before he retired in an insane 48 years old. To put that into perspective, Justin Verlander after putting up an insane Cy Young season at age 39 would have to play nearly another decade before matching Necro's ability to beat Father Time. If there's anyone in the game currently who can match Necro, I believe it has to be Verlander. But back to Necro's pitching performance in 1978, the fact that he didn't win the Cy Young or MVP this season is an absolute travesty. Phil Necro for the year posted a 2.88 ERA, 142 ERA plus, three league leading 22 complete games, four of which were shutouts, started 42 games and threw a league leading 334 and a third innings. Like we mentioned earlier, Necro's war surpassing 10 is insane, but it's mainly attributed to the fact that he threw so many more innings than everyone else. Naturally, Necro led the league in earned runs allowed by sheer sample size. Necro's value as a workhorse was unmatched in 1978, as he started more games than anybody else in the league. Out of the four starters to finish higher than Necro in the voting, 37 starts from Gaylord Perry were the second most. Necro threw nearly 74 more innings than Perry. He was the one who ultimately took home the award, and it's hard to see why. A 21% better than league average ERA plus is by no means Cy Young worthy. He won a league leading 21 games, which is what swayed the voters back in 1978, as the win stat was still a relevant indicator at a pitcher's success. In modern day, we know that it's a team stat more than anything, and while it's nice to have 20 wins and all, it shouldn't be a deciding factor in whether or not someone wins the Cy Young Award. This year was the second of four straight seasons in which Necro led the league in losses. Part of that can be chalked up to two mediocre years. But realistically, the fact that he posted a sub 3.5 ERA in back-to-back -back seasons should not have equated to 38 losses combined. In a four-year stretch from 1977 to 1980, Necro was seven games below 500. In terms of war, it isn't close. 
The top five war values are all under six and Necro posted a war north of 10. Like we mentioned earlier, Necro had some tough luck this season. He lost a league leading 18 games and that definitely hurt his Cy Young case. But finishing sixth in voting? Now that's ridiculous. Even when comparing his war value to that of position players in the NL MVP voting, he exceeds that of Dave Parker, who won the award by more than three war. Parker was great this year, leading the league in average slugging in OPS, but Necro should have definitely been up there with him, in the top three at the very least. Necro finished 17th in voting, which is baffling considering that a majority of players that finished above Necro posted a war half the value of Necro. While we shouldn't live and die by war, I think it's safe to say based off of the many outings Necro saved the bullpen and dominated the competition that he should have been considered for the MVP. A lot of voters are hesitant to elect pitchers as the best player in the league, but Necro made a case that is unlike your typical pitcher. Let me know in the comments down below your thoughts on Phil Necro's 1978 season. Did he deserve to win the Cy Young or MVP? Make sure to leave a like and consider subscribing if you enjoyed, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Later.